This went on for about a half a dozen times <laughs> oh, no. uh, until I finally caught on to what the hell was going on. You also, the, uh, what would cause a lot of casualties were during the takeoff. We lost a lot of aircraft in takeoff. If you figure out that those planes were loaded to the to the max with gasoline and bombs, you know, mm -hmm. and on takeoff you got to use maximum power to get that thing off. You know. It's the only time in the whole mission when the engines, when you need all the power you got, you know, those engines were, I don't know, 14, 12 or 1400, I forget now, it's a horsepower each one of those four engines, and you needed every bit of that horsepower to get off. Now, if you one of those engines failed on, on, on takeoff, you were dead. You were just automatically dead. You wouldn't take off, you would just get up about that far and then you go down again. So that's where a lot of planes, we lost a lot of planes on takeoff. Mm -hmm. so engine failure before engine you even failure. get up oh, yeah. here. Hey, the commercial planes today, you know, like every hundred hours they get a certain kind of check, and every two hundred hours they mm -hmm. get a certain kind of check, and they're wheeled in and they have all these equipment, you know, to check every little thing on them. And they're being checked by guys who have been doing it for 20 years and know what they're doing. Consider this. Every one of the, we had those checks too, but we were being checked by guys who six, seven months ago were working in the Texaco station. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we now didn't building Pratt Whitney's radio. They there. weren't that experienced. <laughs> they, the, the pilots were guys who were kids in school a year ago. Teachers and barbers. Bar <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they were. Well, I was. I, I was in my freshman year in college, and then, then the next thing I knew, I was navigating a B-17 over the ocean, you know, and just like that. And the planes were being maintained by guys who were totally inexperienced. Totally inexperienced. They were good at what they were doing, you know, but well, think about it, you know, that the whole Air Force was a bunch of amateurs. Yeah. Just amateurs. Didn't have enough time Didn't during the war. Well, no. what? <coughs> I'm sorry. One question I have is, uh, 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 along with your navigation, did you have a radio navigation set? I had a radio. Oh, yeah, I had a radio. But, okay, A, you couldn't use it over uh, over combat areas right. because the Ger Germans were, <laughs> weren't cooperative about that. The, when the new bombers were over, there was radio. All the radios in Germany went off the air. So we couldn't use radio. radio. All right. And we couldn't use radio coming home because... Uh, the Germans would the Germans would home in on that, on that and bomb their bases. So there was no radio. They, they, we only used radio for communication. So, so you did, didn't didn't use it for set. radio navigation. Is what you no, said. we didn't, couldn't use radio navigation. But you yeah. didn't talk to each other's airplanes. You just inside. you did talk. You, you talk did talk to each other's airplanes. But but, uh, uh, but what he was talking about <laughs> radio navigation means to uh, to use a radio compass to a home yeah, in I gotcha. to get direction to take a bearing. Any of those you know. beacons, so to speak. Yeah, yeah beacons. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, we couldn't use that. <laughs> so we just the, the navigation was very uh, primitive, let us say, very primitive. But like I said, it was just like what Columbus had. We had a compass. <laughs> That's about it. Now they had a in the B-17. There was a uh, the bubble in the nose that was used for to shoot uh, sextant, oh, wasn't it? Yes, we don't. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is. Do you want me to get you some water? No, I'm all right now. I just don't want to cough through it. Uh, better than half our training during the, the, the what we call the cadet training, uh, when we were first learning navigation, better than half the training was celestial training, which is shooting the stars, the sun, and all that, because uh, they just want, that was part of the training. But in, in as much as we only flew in daytime bombing, mm -hmm. It was a moot point. <laughs> so as soon as, as soon as, uh, we we were given a brand new airplane to fly across to England with, uh, out of Kearney, Nebraska. They would fly the airplanes in from Seattle, Boeing plant, to fly to Kearney, and the Kearney, Nebraska, where the crews would meet to pick up their aircraft. We'd get a brand new aircraft. <laughs> Uh, and it smelled just like a brand new automobile, you know, and had that automobile smell, and it went in and shine and all that. And the pilot would sign for it, sign the receipt for it, just as though he's. And then we got that aircraft, but that wasn't. The, and we had to fly that aircraft across the ocean, 
but that wasn't the aircraft that we would get to fly in combat. Soon as we flew it across the ocean and got it to, to the other side, they took that aircraft away and they took it to what they call a modification center, where they modified it for combat. The first thing that would take done, they took off that astrodome that you're talking about. So actually, the astrodome just put a piece of flat glass across. So the actually, it was even no, though we no got it in our game, it's not there. No, the, no combat. Uh, be something I why, why did they remove it? It's useless. Couldn't use it. Well, yeah, but uh, it, it, you said they put a piece of flat. Well, flat it was a fl was they there replaced the bubble with a piece of just flat glass? What I'm asking is, since since they're taking glass away and putting glass there, was was it interfering with like the pilots? I imagine it could interfere. One of the things about the B-17, I, I said earlier on, it wasn't a uh, user-friendly aircraft at all because uh, when the, when it's being taxied the, the pilot it. couldn't see ahead he couldn't see ahead in the aircraft because it, the, at, the attitude of it is like that it's like yeah, that like a lot of so, the fighters were. so when they taxied we used to have to do S turns so the pilot could see where he was going he would look out the side window and do S turns and similarly if you had a bubble over there I imagine the sun shining on the bubble oh, might yeah, reflect on them so. anything. So they just zapped mm. it up. Oh, okay. So like in case we were time, the pilot could actually see what the hell he was flying. Or Once he got, his when tail he got the tail wing, he got level just before the, yeah, uh, that's the right. main But while you're on the ground, he couldn't see ahead. Did you have a lot of uh, on air, on field collisions? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, you talk Lots. about that in a book a lot, too. Lots. Well, you figure that on every field there were 36 aircraft moving toward the same place at the same time. <laughs> at, night. Oh, at, night. Had, at night. At night. At night. It was dark. Yeah, if you had, like Before like you said, or like 4 o'clock in the morning or something like yeah. that, you got everybody's engines out there fired up, everybody's in their planes, everything's yeah. taxiing out. You no got your planes full of bombs, full of fuel, everything like yeah. that. You, you get a couple of 17s touch each other. It's pretty much history for two 17s there. Plus, you got no running lights on any of the airplane, aircraft either, so it's dark. And okay. I got one question, just like everybody asked the uh, the astronauts whenever they go up or whatever. Did you all go to the uh, bomb Bombay area to relieve yourself or during the flight? Uh, to the how do we piss and how do we shit? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, it wasn't a user-friendly aircraft. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. a men's room. On a, on a That's thing. right. Uh, at, in each area, like in the nose, I don't know what they did in the, any other area, to tell you the truth. I know what happened in the nose. In the nose, for the bombardier and the navigator, there was a, what we call the piss tube. It was a funnel, a black plastic so you funnel. Have a piss tube. Okay. With, with a rubber tube that ran out of the bottom of the aircraft. You, you heard the best part. <laughs> you see? And, <laughs> I've and heard you, of this you take it and you piss. Well, one of the things that happens, yeah, I don't know what happens to you guys. But when I get cold, I get shrinkage. <laughs> Where is it? I don't know what happens to you. Where is it? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean shrinkage. And we get real cold. Real cold. So the colder below. you get, the more it would shrink. Plus, the string was true. Huh? No, the string, <laughs> I, that was going to ask, was the string true in the, the book? The string was absolutely true. So, and we had so many layers of clothing. You know, I'd have, when I would go on a mission, I'd have on two pairs of what they call long johns, uh -huh. you know, long underwear. I'd, I'd wear two pairs of long johns. I'd wear a pair of GI pants, which was wool, khaki wool. And then I'd have my fatigues, which is like a flying suit, you know, uh, coveralls. I'd have that over on top of that, you see. And then I would have, um, I guess that was enough of the, uh, what I had on there, you know. Well, by the time you butt down, get down to the business end down there, and your fingers are numb, <laughs> you think it's shrunk. It's not only shrunk, it's paralyzed. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's numb. I mean, it's really numb. So you got to fiddle around. You don't even know if you got it in your hand. You know? <laughs> it's that little nub there. You know, and I'm not King Kong to begin with. You know, <laughs> and then you center it over that funnel there. And this actually happened in my first mission. I, uh, <laughs> the guy who goes before you, you know, he pisses down there, and when you're at altitude, piss freezes. At 60 below <laughs> zero, especially. Piss freezes. And, but you, but it freezes in the tube. The uh -huh, funnel yeah. is clear. The top part is clear. So you piss in there, 
and the thing's backing up on you and you don't even know it and you're standing there with a handful of piss <laughs> frozen piss. Yeah. I tell you that wasn't a user friendly aircraft <laughs> and I can imagine when you're coming in to land the lower you get then it starts uh, oh it uh, starts smelling off it starts <laughs> oh, it starts oh, back oh, that's just and the, the poor out. tail gunners got it all coming toward him oh, oh you oh, talking to book about another thing yeah <laughs> I put you piss, and it would go through. It's right down. Well, the ball turret gunner. Oh no! Oh no! He, you always had to warn him when you were going to piss, because if he was facing forward, it would. The, the, he had a piece of glass to look through, and the, if, if that froze up. He couldn't see. Oh. He'd be looked through. Turn around. Go take a leak. I don't he, want you to see me do this. He just couldn't see. <laughs> he couldn't think it. He freezes well, up. And he, and he couldn't get outside and scrape it off. <laughs> Pull over real quick. So you usually had to warn him. That's the lessons learned. Yeah, lessons learned. Oh, that's that's why when you get over there, you have to fly four or five missions with another crew until you get on to what the hell it's all about. Are you talking about the inexperience of the guys six months before you get in there and stuff? that they, they were soda jerks and they were car salesmen and whatever but it was like we had talked about earlier the oldest, the, he was talking about earlier the commanders of bases were 24 and 25 years old or yeah. younger these guys were all 19, 20 and 21 years old yeah. you know the whole air force was probably not over 25 years old that's right you, know, for, for, uh, you, you, you see I, in the movies all the commanders of the bases and stuff was, were, it was 26, 27 we called him the old man yeah know, well it, it's like uh, you know you and you hear about the the black sheep, the Q14. You know, Pappy Boyne. Well, he was an like old man. 31, 32 years old. Well, he was Pappy. He was he Grand was Pappy. an old yeah. old guy compared to these young yeah. young guys. That's well, you look at uh, at Bruce Carr and Bud Anderson, all the, your fighter aces that are that are up in in with the Gabowski, with the one that just died here not too long ago. Um, in Chuck Yeager, all these aces with 20 and 25. I'll tell him earlier, all these kills, 20 and 30 kills in the Mustang, and they were so great and it was so bad or so lucky, however you want to look at it, they were 19 and 20 years old doing that. And I told him before, it's hard to realize that when I was 19 and 20 years old, could I have done that? Or, or my son, who is now 21, 22, and 23 years old, could they have done that? And it's... it's, it, it's well, it's well, when you I go can, to war, you, you, I can get, say, you get taught to. I can say this, and and knowing some of, some of the guys that train to do what the guys over at Afghanistan are, are doing, the Rockson guys, uh, these are 18, 18, 19, 20 year old guys and one of the guys said in one of the cameras that I heard directly from some of the other guys it, it face to face prior to war, it's like you do what you're going to have to do you know, to survive, there's people shooting at you so yeah, but you're just he, going to... Well, he mentioned something about it and Mr. Clark had mentioned something about it too, yeah, you, you, in, in those times, in those situations uh, you, you, you can do it. You, you can do it. But Mr. Clark had made the statement one time, and and, and you can it, is that well they do the, they're doing the same things now that they did back then. Well, yes they are, but it's, it's not it's not the same because nowadays you were you were basically face to face with your enemy when you were fighting your enemy and stuff. Nowadays these guys are in these F-16s. They're flying along, and the closest they see the enemy are a blip on a radar scope. They push a button. They send the missile off. The blip disappears. That's the extent of their of their, of their meeting the enemy. And, and I understand that. And you you made a statement earlier. Whenever you uh, you're at twenty five thousand feet and you're dropping bombs, the the uh, the enemy that you're seeing is indifferent to you because you you can't see the enemy other than he's shooting at you. Well, and you're well, the only enemy, the only enemy we ever saw was fight the fighters. Yeah. But and we didn't always see fighters, but we were always dropping bombs. So. And you and and I could relate to that because. Uh, in Desert Storm, I'm I'm uh, uh, 8,000 meters from the enemy, and I'm watching the war. Even though I'm hovering there and seeing missiles come up.